How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Buddy's House of Horror Podcast, and welcome to another edition of every single horror film I saw in 2023. I'm reviewing every single one of them. In this episode, we're talking about films that I saw from June all the way until about August, the summer months of 2023. What was I watching in between heading out to the beach and going on hikes. What horror films was I checking out in the summer of 2023? We're going to get to all that in just a second, but if you guys haven't already, please make sure you're subscribing to the show wherever you're listening to the show, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Make sure you're dropping a like, dropping a follow, leaving a rating and a review, and spreading the good word about the House of Horror. If you have any friends, family members, co-workers, anyone that would enjoy the show, make sure you're pointing this show in their direction and telling them to check it out. And without further ado, we're going to get right to this episode so now let's get spooky how's it going everyone welcome back to another edition of buddy's house of horror podcast it has been quite a while since i've done an episode for you guys and as always this is my way of sort of you know dusting off the old vocal folds because vocal cords are not a thing We're getting used to the podcast season again. I don't know when this episode is going to be coming out. I might hold it off until October at this point because it is rather late in the season in which I am recording this. I could release it now. I could release it later. But regardless, this will probably be a comeback sort of episode because whenever you're listening to this, there's going to be a little bit of a gap between this episode and whatever the previous episode was, whether it be the long gap between the beginning of year and now or whatever episode that I did up until October. So this will either be the first episode of October or just a random episode that I release whenever I feel like releasing it. The reason I'm doing this today is because I sort of just told myself if I'm waiting for the perfect moment to record a podcast, if I'm waiting for all of the stars to align, if I'm waiting for everything in my life to be going absolutely perfectly, and if, if I'm waiting to be in the perfect mood, if I'm waiting for you know, my energy level to be up. Am I waiting for my voice to sound absolutely perfect? It's not raspy at all. I got a good night's sleep the night before. I didn't sleep with my mouth gaping open and my voice sounds like absolute garbage. If I wait for everything to align in order to recall, record a fucking podcast, I'm never going to record a podcast because I just kind of came to terms with the fact that not all the stars are going to align every single time. You're never in a perfect situation to do something. So you know what? You just need to kind of bite the bullet. You just need to, you know, you know just fucking do it. You need to fucking do it. I'm going to slur over my words. I'm going to stumble over things, and that's okay. I am out of pro- I am out of practice. See, I tried to say pro- progress and practice. I'm stumbling over shit, and you know what? You're never going to get perfect. You're never going to get better. You're never going to get truly comfortable doing things until you just do them on a regular basis. So you know what? Biting the bullet. I'm fucking doing it. We are recording one of the conclusions. Hopefully, I think believe this is part three. It might potentially even be part, you know, three, the finale, or it might be part three out of four is what I'm trying to say. This might be the finale. This might be the coming up to the finale. This might be the martini shot. You know, uh, actually, is that what it's called? It's called the Abbey Singer. This might be the Abbey shot. The Martini shot may be next episode. Or this might be the Martini shot. I don't know. There's some film lingo for you guys. Because, of course, we're always talking about film on Buddy's House of Horror. Well, not always talking about film. But we're talking about films a lot of the time on Buddy's House of Horror. And today, we're going to be continuing my discussion. This is part three of reviewing every single horror film that I saw within the year of 2023. Of course, we did this episode back in October, parts one and two, and we're going to be continuing it on, rounding out the rest of my summer of that year, potentially getting into the fall, potentially getting into the winter, as uh, according to how things go within this podcast. I am, I don't know. I am ready to do this, but I'm also not ready to do this, as I said, because, you know, it's been a crazy beginning of the year for me. Everything, and I'm not going to go into all the details of what's been going on within my personal life, but it has been an insane year for very, very bad reasons and also some good reasons. Um, But it's been very insane. Uh, Shout out to my family, friends, my wife, everyone who's been helping me get through this really sort of tumultuous year, this really sort of difficult and strange year that I've had. Um, But I've come to find out 
that doing the things that make you happy are going to start to turn your year around. So I am going to be doing this episode and hopefully be doing a lot more episodes in preparation for October. Um, because this is what makes me happy. Just talking about film, being able to talk about the things that I love. It truly makes me happy. And it makes me happy that some of you guys are listening along for the ride. I never care about viewers. I'm not trying to be like a fucking YouTube star millionaire. But, you know, my small circle of people that listen to my show, I genuinely appreciate you guys for sticking around with me through all these years. And I'm going to keep coming out with shit whether people are listening to it or not. Um, today, I have a very different beverage than what I'm used to. This is the Dr. Pepper Creamy Coconut. And I've got it in my ghost koozie. Um, because it is quite cold because we just got our brand new fridge. Um, because yes, our fridge broke that contributed to the really difficult, strange, bizarre year. I've been without a fridge for several weeks. Finally have a new fridge. It's ice cold and it is so cold that I need to put koozies on my beverages. So I've got this creamy coconut, Dr. Pepper here. This just came out. A quick review of the soda pop. Again, it's very different from what I'm used to drinking. I'm normally drinking diet pops if I'm drinking pop at all. Um, and I'm, I was very sort of skeptical about this flavor of Dr. Pepper because I'm not typically a coconut guy. I don't gravitate towards coconut. There are a few coconut things that I like, but it's never a flavor that's like, yes, if I were to see this sitting on the shelf in the store, this is not something I would normally pick up. My wife bolted to the aisle when she saw this was on the shelf, put it in the cart. I was not upset because there were a lot of beverages there that I would have preferred instead of a creamy coconut Dr. Pepper at the time. But regardless, we got it. We brought it home. I tried it, and I do say that it is rather delectable. I'm going to take another sip of it here. So the pros and cons of this beverage. Pros. Really love the taste. It's like a subtle aftertaste of coconut. Kind of makes you feel like you took a sip of pop and then take a nice big bite out of an Almond Joy. Really enjoy it. Really refreshing. The bad side, I feel like my arteries are clogging with each sip. I feel like with each sip, I'm getting deeper and deeper cavities. Um, because, again, I'm not used to drinking normal pop. I'm used to drinking diet pop, if any pop at all. So this is doing a number for my health. I'll tell you that right now. I guarantee this is taking years off of my life just drinking this small can of Dr. Pepper uh, creamy coconut right now on my desk. But... It is quite delectable. It is very delectable, and I'm going to continue to sip on it throughout the duration of this podcast. We've got a lot of films to go through. We've got a lot of things to talk about. Of course, we always love the episodes where they're basically just me scrolling through my diary on Letterboxd. Those are always the most fantastical episodes, really gearing you up for the spooky season. It's a guy staring at his phone, talking about shit that he vaguely remembers because it was so, so long ago. If I remember correctly, which I know that I remember correctly, the last film that we talked about, I believe, was Cocaine Bear, which rounded out the month of June of 2023. So we're picking it up with July of 2023. I'm going to kind of blow past the several films that I watched within two days. On July 6th and July 7th, I watched the entire Insidious franchise. Not necessarily in order. Because I ended up seeing the new one in theaters, Insidious the Red Door, and then went home and rewatched several more of the franchise. So the way that I watched it, I watched Insidious the Red Door. For some reason, I watched Insidious Chapter 2 next, just because I know chronologically some parts of it take place before Insidious 1. Then I watched the original Insidious, watched Insidious Chapter 3. I actually took an, uh, another day, so wow, this was three days. And Insidious, the last key was on the 8th of July. It was the 8th of July, which was actually not how the song went, but you get the point of what I am saying. Insidious, the red door. I mean, I, the reason I kind of want to blow past these is because I can see myself doing a much more in-depth review of this franchise later on, potentially this month, potentially a few years down the road. But Insidious is a franchise that I've always had a deep connection to. I've seen every film in the franchise in theaters, like right when it came out, if not opening day, opening weekend, for sure. And it's just a series that's always stuck with me. Like, I remember, 
fond memories of going to see these films in theaters. There's not many franchises where I've seen each installment in theaters when it came out. I believe Insidious is pretty much the only one. Um, I don't want to go too in-depth about this, as I said, but Insidious the Red Door, I really liked the film when it came out. I haven't rewatched it since. It's been a bit of time since it's came out. Um, I can't believe they were able to get the original kids to come back to reprise their roles. It would have been such an easy thing to sort of recast them, but I love that they went the extra mile and actually got all the main cast back. Um, There's a lot of these things in this film that are probably going to hit closer to home to me now than they did when I watched it. Um, But the film itself, I really enjoyed. I popped for the end credits song. That is a whole story in and of itself. But in cities, the red door, I noticed that like miles didn't really like it on his letterbox store, I noticed that a lot of people were kind of indifferent to it. For some reason, I like really liked the red door. I think as far as like your PG 13 horror films are concerned, that's pretty much as good as you can get within this modern era. I enjoyed the film quite a bit. Again, I have a lot of nostalgia for the series. I have a lot of nostalgia for the franchise. So for me, it was a no brainer. to like insidious, the red door. I know a lot of people thought it was average, but it doesn't really matter to me again. After that, I said, I watched insidious chapter two. Um, I didn't realize until this year, you know, the historical significance of Lee Winnell. I mean, obviously he was an actor within Saw, but I didn't realize until like deep diving into a lot of these films, like how much he contributed to a lot of the films that we were watching at the time. I mean, a lot of people talk about like James Wan, but Lee Winnell is like right there with him along with all these things. And he even contributes because he's like an actor too. He's not always just like behind the scenes. So like, it was really kind of unique seeing it through that lens. And I went in this whole, you know, Lee Winnell Wikipedia articles and all this other like online resources, like a deep dive into his career around this time. So like in between films and like during the end credits of stuff, I'm like really like reading up on this guy, learning a lot about his backstory. I never really realized how much of a significance he was going to have. Um, the overdubbing in this film is absolutely ridiculous. There are some things in this film that I don't like. Um, young Elise says, I've never seen such a malignant presence. That is a line in the film that really stuck out to me because of course, uh, there would be the film malignant that came out a lot later, a little bit of a reference there. Um, Another reference I picked up was there was Carnival Souls on the bedroom TV, and there's weird editing jump cuts when you're in Elise's house. Like, that really threw me off. I remember liking Insidious Chapter 2 a lot more than the original when it first came out. I remember really, really loving Insidious 2. Going back and listening to it now, or watching it now, rather, it's not really better than Part 1. I still think Part 1 is probably the best in the series. Um... But Insidious Chapter 2, I gave it a respectable score. It's three and a half stars, which is the same score that I gave Insidious the Red Door. Um, The first film, again, it was a classic. It still is a classic within my eyes. Um, I'll read the description for the original Insidious because I forgot to read the descriptions for the rest of the films. And I normally read all the letterbox descriptions, but you know what? I fucked up for the first two. I just started talking. I royally fucked up, bruh. Anyway, Insidious, from 2010, directed by James Wan. It's not the house that's haunted, as we come to find out. It's your son. A family discovers that dark spirits have invaded their home after their son's inexplicably falls into an endless sleep. When they reach out to professional for help, they learn things are a lot more personal than they thought. Of course, it's a classic classic horror film it's a film that i could talk about for a long time a franchise i could talk about for a long time i always like the scenes that always stick out to me about the original film is like the long tracking shot where um the wife is walking through the house and you see the little like period piece kid like the old timey kid walking around of course you have the red-faced demon who shows up behind josh and gives you that classic jump scare one of the best jump scares in modern years of course the red lipstick demon at the end to tiny tim sharpening his claws one of the most ridiculous things i've ever seen in my entire life but i love it um one thing that i really like about the first film is it does a great job establishing these characters you really get a sense of who they are even within this first film without going on to chapter two chapter three stuff like that we really get a sense of who everybody is the family elise uh lee winnell's character and the other comic relief character 
Um, there's also a drawing of Jigsaw that I noticed in the background that I've never noticed before. Another reference to a film that they've done before. Um, the original Insidious, I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece. Like, I'm not saying it's a five-star film, but it's a solid, solid four-star film, the original Insidious. There's not as much to say about it. Insidious Chapter 3, I think, is one of the weaker films in the franchise. A lot of people love Chapter 3. I never really got the Chapter 3 hype. When it first came out, I thought it was just okay. I put it, like, on par with the other two. A lot of people really love Part 3. They hold Part 3 to a really high acclaim. I see a lot of four stars on my letterbox. For me, it's just a three. There's some things about it that I like. There's some things about it that I don't like. I think it's an incredibly average installment in the franchise this was 2015 so five years later so there were three films within those five years this one was actually directed by lee winnell chapter three was i'm not sure who directed chapter two give me a quick quick check that was also by james wan so the third one they passed the torch to the to the next horror auteur lee winnell the description this is how you die a twisted new tale of terror begins for a teenage girl and her family and revealing more mysteries of the otherworldly realm the further. This one is a prequel. Um, the thing that's tricky about prequel films is the fact that I really feel like a lot of the times there's no real stakes. Like, you know who's going to live. You know who's going to die based upon who's in the next film. I mean, not every single character, but you know... Elise is going to be fine. You know that because we see her in the other films. So, you know, at the end of part three, she's going to be totally fine. Same with the comic relief characters. You know, they're going to be totally fine. It's just kind of like a tricky thing to do, doing, doing like a prequel film. Um, so I, in general, I tend to dislike prequels because I genuinely, yeah, like I said, like I don't feel any sort of, significance to them i kind of see them as like side stories to the main story because again you kind of know what's going to lead up to that point of course it can lead to plot twists stuff like that um from later on down the line but for the most part i'm not a prequel guy for the most part i'm not a prequel guy um again not as much to say about part three i do plan on doing a deep dive into these films um and next we have the last key which I think at the time was undoubtedly the worst. Upon my rewatch, like I didn't find it as bad as I did in theaters. When I saw it in theaters, I thought it was absolutely awful. On this next rewatch, I actually found myself rather enjoying parts of it. Again, no masterpiece by any means. But I really enjoyed part of it. Fear comes home. Parapsychologist Elise Rayner and her team travel to Five Keys, New Mexico to investigate a man's claim of a haunting. Terror soon strikes when Rainier realizes that the house he lives in was her old family's home. Again, another prequel, but I think that this one truly ties in to the other films a lot more, so I enjoy this one's significance a little more than I do Part 3. Part 3 is a prequel. It's leading up to how the gang got together, but this one is actually tying in plot points from the other films. So the last key I think is actually better than part three as sacrilegious as that may sound, but I found myself enjoying it a lot more than I did the first time around watching it. I haven't done an official like series ranking or anything. Uh, maybe I'll have to rewatch all of them again to do like an official ranking. This one's the best then followed by this followed by this guarantee. The first one's going to be the best, but regardless that is the insidious franchise that I watched over the first several days of July, the 6th, 7th, and the 8th. Moving on to another film that I watched on the 8th, The Screaming Skull. This is a film that I had heard about years and years back during the camp cult season of Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. I believe it was the camp cult season because this film is definitely not one, not two, but maybe three to four stops short from being a classic film. Of course, this is one of the illustrious um, B movies from the 80s. I mean, not 80s, from 1958. I meant to say 5080s. My apologies. From the 5080s. <laughs> Um, the Screaming Skull, it's barely over an hour. 
It's a 68 minute film. I had put it on just as something, you know, something laid back that I didn't really have to pay too much attention to um, to break up the madness of my insidious marathon. The Screaming Skull. The torture ghost who claims vengeance in the bride's bedroom. Newlyweds Eric and Jenny Whitlock retire to this desolate mansion where Eric's first wife, Marianne, died from a mysterious freak accident. Jenny, who has a history of mental illness, begins to see strange things, including a mysterious skull, which may or may not be a product of her imagination. The plot of this film is very convoluted. Um, because not only is the husband praying, playing pranks on the wife because of her mental illness is trying to get her to go even more insane, but the dead wife is actually coming back and just also so happens to be a screaming skull. So he's using a fake skull to try to scare his wife, and then there's a real disembodied skull roaming around the house trying to get everyone as well. So it's a very convoluted plot. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, which is common for some of these 80s. I keep saying 80s. Some of these 50s B-movies. Um, something that I always admired about The Screaming Skull is the fact that it just it doesn't even try to take itself seriously whatsoever. Like some of these 50s B-movies, they can be so corny, but yet everyone is playing it so straight. So it kind of feels a little bit disjointed. This one, I get the feeling everyone knew they were making crap. So it's not something that, you know, anyone on either side of the camera or the audience is really having high expectations for how this is supposed to be. Again, it's a film, it's barely over an hour. If you're having a Halloween party and you just want something stupid to put on in the background, The Screaming Skull might be a solid candidate for something that you could put on. Um, as far as 50s B-movies go, it's one that I always think about just because it was featured on Cinemassacre's Monster Madness, but I haven't really dived too deep into the barrel of all of these 50s movies to see which ones are the worst and which ones are the best. The Screaming Skull, for what it is, I think it's an entertaining watch, just as long as you know 100% what you're getting yourself into. This is a one to one and a half star film. So if that's what you're in the mood for, I would say check it out. Coming up next is Knock at the Cabin. Of course, it was a new release film. I believe I watched it as soon as it hit streaming. Um, this, of course, was one of the comeback films from M. Night Shyamalan, starring Dave Bautista and some other relatively well-known names within the film. I believe it had a lot, little bit of controversy when it first came out, um, but the controversy has since died down. And, you know, the film, I thought for what it was, because I had gone into it thinking, okay, this is going to be... It's either going to be one of two things. It's going to be a complete shit show, which some Shyamalan films have tended to be over the years, or it's going to be something amazing because everyone was raving about how amazing it was. I think it was a little bit in the middle of the road. I gave it two and a half out of five stars. Save your family or save humanity. Make the choice. While vacationing at a remote cabin, a young girl and her parents are taken hostage by four armed strangers who demand that the family make an unthinkable choice to advert the apocalypse. With limited access to the outside world, the family must decide what they believe before all is lost. Again, this film, um, I like the story. I like the concept behind it. I like the characters and the dynamic between all of the characters. But I just feel that it should have been and could have been so much better than what it was. Of course, it's a Shyamalan film. There are twists and turns along the way. And I don't know, man. There's just something about it that doesn't doesn't really, really click with me. Like, I enjoyed the film. I enjoyed watching the film. I like Again, I like the story. I like the characters. I like the concept. I like the plot. I like the story, but just something about it is missing. There's something about it. That's just not checking all of the boxes. I'm not sure what exactly it is. Um, but I did enjoy watching it. There are a couple things that are a little bit ridiculous about it. Of course. Um, Batista is great in it, of course. And there's really not a whole lot to say about knock at the cabin. Again, it's been since July, since I've seen it. So it's been a very long time since I've actually watched the film. So Next is The Boogeyman, also from 2023. This is around the time where I was trying to knock out a lot of films that have come out in 2023. It was a goal of mine to watch 50 new releases in 2023, and I actually met that goal. So sometimes I was just really trying to find anything and anything 
from that year that I could watch just to ch- cross it off the list. So the next couple films, The Boogeyman and the film I saw almost immediately after it, Creepy Pasta, are just two 2023 films that I was like, all right, you know what? I'll give them a shot. It's going to knock something off of my list. Um, the Boogeyman is a film that Miles, leading up to it, was hyping it up. He's like, it's based off of Stephen King, this and that. He was right, ranting and raving about it. It's one of his favorite films of not only the year, but one of his favorite films of all time. The Boogeyman from 2023. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real, as the tagline says. Still reeling from the tragic death of their mother, a teenage girl and her younger sister find themselves plagued by a sadistic presence in their house and struggle to get past their grieving father to pay attention before it's too late. There were a few things about this film that I liked. I remember really liking the intro to the film. I remember really liking some of the things that they would do once the creature was out and about. Um, there's a pet peeve of mine in films, and this film cracked cracked that pet peeve. That film made that pet peeve crawl into my brain. And in video games, I can be a little bit more forgiving of this. If it's more supernaturally based films or more fantasy films, I'm more forgiving of this. But a pet peeve of mine is when you're watching a film... And within that film, there's a location with a bunch of candles lit all over the place. And who the fuck is lighting all of these candles? She goes into this abandoned house. There are candles lit everywhere. Not only is it a fire hazard, but who is having the time to go in there, light all those candles, and just wait for the main character to show up without any of the candles burning out, without the house burning down, without a gust of wind knocking the candles over, causing an explosion of some kind. It just doesn't make any sense. At least this movie kind of explained it with the girl with the flame torch. So that's what I mean. This one sort of had the pet peeve come out, but it sort of debunked the own pet peeve within its own mythology, which is fine. Um, We have the supernatural entity who can teleport and do basically whatever it wants. And the main characters in this film are trying to shoot it to death. This character can manipulate space and time. It can move back and forth. It can do all these things, but you're going to shoot it a couple times like it's fucking Nemesis. It didn't work with Nemesis. You had to fucking do a whole kinds of other shit in Resident Evil to get him down finally. They're trying to shoot him down. It doesn't make any sense. It's like they're going up against Godzilla trying to use the military. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. This film just bothers me. It's a good popcorn-esque movie just put it on shut your brain off and it doesn't really matter too much but it's not something that's going to leave a lasting impact on you those are my thoughts on the boogeyman we're going to move past this one real quick because i tried to watch creepypasta which is an anthology film about creepypastas and it was one of the worst things i've seen it was so boring and i don't want to drag it through the dirt so i'm not going to go on and rip all about it But I had slightly higher expectations for this one. Not that it had to be a good, you know, solid two or even three star film. But I wanted it to at least be somewhat watchable. And I found it completely unwatchable. It's not just a story anymore. Trapped in an abandoned house, a nameless man desperately searches for clues to how he got there. The answer is hidden within a series of disturbing viral videos, each of which begins to infect his mind. So literally, it's just a dude watching creepypastas. I think you would have a better time just going on YouTube and watching people read the creepypastas to you, which I have done many times. Um, Again, I wish the film was a little bit better. I wish that... Because the opportunities are endless. There are so many creepypastas out there. I would love for someone to do a more big-budget creepypasta-esque film. But this film ain't it, Chief. It just ain't it. The next film that I watched, it was on VHS. I believe my wife actually requested to watch this. Every once in a while, since I have this old CRT TV, like an old TV CR, every once in a while, we'll just pop on some VHS or whatever, and we selected to watch The Black Cat, one of my favorite films from that era of film. This is 1934. This is Bela Lugosi. It was produced by Universal. One of my favorites from that era. Things you never said before, nor even dreamed of. After a road accident in Hungary, 
the American honeymooners Joan and Peter and the enigmatic Dr. Vertigast find refuge in the house of a famed architect, Perlzig, who shares a dark past with the Doctor. This is a great film starring Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, and it's them going at it. It's two guys at the peak of their popularity going at it in a film. They did The Black Cat. They also did The Raven um, within the same similar time period. In fact, the VHS that I have is both of them on the same tape. The Black Cat is first, so that's when we watched that one. We didn't watch it all the way through to The Raven, although I do think The Raven might be the better of the two films, but I really enjoy The Black Cat. Pearl Zig is such a great villain. Dr. Vertigast and him are constantly trying to up the ante who's going to outsmart the other guy. Um, there's torture involved. There's spells. There's some creepy shit. There's a lot of shit in here that I cannot believe that they got away with in the 1930s, but... Again, we got a lot of films to go through, so I'm going to leave it at that. There's not a whole lot more that I need to say about The Black Cat from 1934. If you haven't seen it already, it's probably not the first Universal film you should start with. Definitely after you watch all of the classics and then you're looking for a little bit more obscure stuff, you can pop on The Black Cat. I think you will have a great time. Coming up next, I rewatched all the Wallace and Gromit films again, but I'm not going to talk about them again because I did that in one of my last episodes of the horror films that I saw in 2023. But of course, A Grand Day Out, The Wrong Trousers, and A Close Shave. And then towards the end of the month, I guess it's just a good time to bring it up because I did not necessarily do it within the... Um, didn't necessarily do it as a horror film because neither of these are horror films, but... One of my favorite theater-going experiences of all time was doing the Barbenheimer double feature. I did that on the day after opening day. I believe this was on that Saturday, so that was on the 22nd. Watching both of those films, just being in the theater all day, going out to dinner in between, hanging out with friends, one of the most fun times that I've had going to the movie theater in a very, very long time. So this is going to round out the month of July for films that I watched, but I actually re-watched a series that kind of delves into the spooky genre quite a bit. Um, Expedition Unknown Search for the Afterlife. Um, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Are you tired of plain old breakfast? Cereal is not sugary enough. Are you tired of burnt pancakes and waffles? Then you need slapjacks. The slap I got your face that it causes a chemical reaction to heat up. No cooking required. Just slap and eat. Don't believe us? Here's a satisfied customer. Slapjacks are the best breakfast food ever made. Slapjacks, slap those smiles back. <laughs> You heard it here, kids. Slapjack saves lives. Order at www.slapjacks.com. So as I said, the next thing that I watched was Expedition Unknown, Search for the Afterlife. Um, I guess a little bit of background of this. I had only heard about this through Talk is Jericho. The host of the show, Josh Gates, was on Talk is Jericho. I want to say in about 2018 or 2017, whenever this came out or was about to come out, he was on the Jericho podcast because although I've always been aware of Expedition Unknown, I was never, I mean, I've never really been a fan of television. Like, I don't sit down and watch a lot of TV shows, stuff like that. Like, I'm more of a movie person. So I had heard of Expedition Unknown. I've heard of Josh Gates. I've seen a few casual episodes here and there. But when I heard he was doing an entire mini series basically a little subset of the main show focused solely on the afterlife it's something that really sparked my interest and i watched it that year when it came out and i've watched it maybe every two to three years since then so i think this is my second or third time watching it because i've definitely seen it at least twice this may have been the third time that i watched it but basically um I watched it all the way back then and just sort of I, every couple of years I have the the feeling that I want to rewatch it, including this year. Like this year, I have the feeling that I want to rewatch it again, even though it's only been a year since then. I mean, obviously, since then, my father has passed away. So my ideas of the afterlife um, not necessarily have changed, but like I've definitely been thinking a lot more about what happens when we die. So this series really has hit for me the past couple of years. I have a feeling it's going to hit for me whenever I do decide to rewatch it again. But every episode sort of takes on a different element of death. 
um, in the first episode. It's called Heaven and Hell. It shows the gateways to hell that are in Turkey. A. The second episode's called Death and Beyond. Um, it has to do with a psychic taking, um, trying to contact one of the hosts recent aunts who have passed away talks about reincarnation he actually travels to india and participates in burning rituals um i'm not going to go through every single episode in depth because i do think that the series like if you were to really break down everything that goes on everything that's talked about everything that happens within that series you would be here for an entire episode so maybe someday when i do rewatch the series i will do a full episode dedicated to the search for the afterlife because i really do enjoy it um, that mini series quite a bit. I think it's about four or five episodes long. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it every time that I have watched it. And I look forward to watching it again. And now we are moving on to the month of August. In the month of August, there are quite a few films that I watched. So I don't know if it has been apparent listening to this podcast because we've been going for quite a while now there is no way i'm getting through all of 2023 within this podcast so this is going to be part three out of four i would imagine i imagine i'd be able to hammer out the rest in one more part but i think maybe we try to power our way through august i'll kind of see where we're at timeline wise because inevitably there's going to be a spot where we're gonna have to cut it off like there's gonna have to be a spot where I'm like, you know what? This is going to take four parts because there is no way I'm going to ha- put out like a two to three hour episode about this. So we're going to have to break it up into another episode. But let's stop babbling and just keep going through. The first film that I watched in August was Infinity Pool. Of course, directed by Brandon Cronenberg, starring who is now basically an icon of horror, at least in this modern era, Mia Goth. Also stars Alexander Skarsgård um, as the leads in the film. Find out what kind of a creature you really are. While staying at an isolated island resort, James and Emma are enjoying a perfect vacation of pristine beaches, exceptional staff, and soaking up the sun. But guided by the seductive and mysterious Gabby, they venture outside of the resort grounds and find themselves in a culture filled with violence, hedonism, and untold horror. A tragic accident leaves them facing a zero-tolerance policy for crime. Either you'll be executed, or, if you're rich enough to afford it, you can watch yourself die instead. Um, This film presented a lot of interesting ideas. I like the general concept of this film. I like the general aesthetic of this film. I like what they were going for, but in execution, I did not find this film to be the most enjoyable watch. Um, I am glad that I saw it. I'm glad that I watched it. I did enjoy parts of it as I was watching it. Um, All in all, it's getting two out of five stars for me for Infinity Pool. There's not as much for me to say about it because it is one of those that you kind of just have to... It's to be seen is to be believed. So I kind of don't want to get too deep into the story elements and stuff like that. But Infinity Pool, not for me. I'll probably never watch it again. Um, But I do appreciate what it was trying to do. And I'm glad that a lot of people like it. A lot of people really like this film. I'm kind of in the minority of people who thought it was just kind of okay. Um, another film that I thought was just kind of okay is coming up on our list. Very next, the next film that I watched was, I won't say it's a, yeah, it's a remake. It is a remake of a film that I saw in theaters when I was a child. So I have seen both Haunted Mansion movies in theaters in my lifetime. This, of course, the 2023 version. Home is where the haunt is. A woman and her son enlist a motley crew of so-called supernatural experts to help get rid of their home of supernatural squatters. This film really was a mixed bag, wasn't it? There are a lot of things in this film that I think it did a lot better this time around than it did back in the early 2000s with the Eddie Murphy version. But there's a lot of things about the Eddie Murphy version that I think are vastly superior to this version. Um, One of the things I liked about this remake of The Haunted Mansion is I'm not going to go into a big Disney lore drop here, but one of the things with The Haunted Mansion is it's a thousand happy haunts. I like that the ghosts in this are kind of more in tune with that 
because in the original, a lot of them are mean, nasty, scary. This one, there's just a much more happiness sort of vibe in it. I mean, obviously there are villains involved with that, but I like just kind of the general tone of this one a little bit better. Um, I do think that the younger version, um, the older version, I mean, which I saw when I was younger, is quite scary for kids. When I watched that film, I was fucking terrified out of my mind. Like, there's the scene where they go down in the mausoleum. Like, there's actual, like, creepy shit in there. This one, I mean, to my recollection, I mean, it's been a bit since I've watched it, but this is definitely one that I think is more child-friendly. Like, you don't need to worry about your kids really getting freaked out by this. With the 2003 version, like, it's it's a little something to, to behold for children. Like, I was definitely freaked out when I saw that one. Um, a lot of things that I like in this as well is, like, once you... End of the house is not going to let you leave because there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here where, and again, not giving anything away, not that this is a masterpiece either. I only gave this one two stars, but I liked the general tone. I liked the aesthetic. I can acknowledge that it is a bad film, which is why I only gave it two stars. Um, I think between the two, you have almost a good movie between the two of them. I think if you were to take elements from the first one, elements from this one, put them together, um, you'd be able to have something that is pretty decent. Um, I like a lot of the people involved in this. Um, of course, a lot of the actors you know from other things, Rosario Dawson, Lakeith Stanfield, Owen Wilson's in here, Danny DeVito's in here. Um, Jared Leto as the Hatbox Ghost, I mean, you kind of could have put anyone to be the Hatbox Ghost. It's not really a Jared Leto-specific thing. So I'm not really the biggest fan of their portrayal of the Hatbox Ghost. I'm not the biggest fan of the lore that this film kind of introduced about the Hatbox Ghost. He's always kind of had, like, a mysterious sort of backstory. Like, I don't like the backstory that they officially gave him in this. I like it when it was more kind of up in the air because you kind of just see him when you're on the theme park ride and you're like, what's going on with this dude? Um, so not the biggest fan of that. Again, I think if you were to take some ideas from this, some ideas from the original one, you'd almost have a good film. I don't know why it's such a difficult task to make a good Haunted Mansion film, but apparently they tried tr twice and they've struck out both times. Um, coming up next, a few days later, actually the next day, I was seeing a lot of films. So like I saw a film on the 9th, the 10th, the 11th. I was watching stuff for a solid stretch in August. And the next film that I watch is a film that I've talked about on many shows to death. So I'm going to simply skip over when I watched The Night Stalker. I watched The Night Stalker at least once a year at this point. At this point, I'm at, <clears throat> at at least once a year. Think about it. I've done other episodes about The Night Stalker, some episodes you're going to hear very soon or have not um, heard already, um, depending on the release schedule of this. You're going to hear an episode about The Night Stalker already. I've talked about it for the 50th anniversary. I've talked about it on many, many shows. I've been on the Call Shack Loop podcast. So we'll skip that for right now and move on to the film that I saw the very next day, which was a film that I was incredibly hyped for. Incredibly hyped for. Because if there's something I like as much as much as I like Call Shack, it is Dracula himself. And of course, I'm talking about the first Dracula type movie since Renfield, there's two films in one year. I've never really seen Dracula movies in theaters before, but we got two of them in the same year in theaters. The Last Voyage of the Demeter, which I thought was an incredible concept to go with because it gives you the opportunity to adapt an area of the novel that is very short. Like the, the, the time that they're on the Demeter it isn't shown in depth in the novel about what actually happened. This is something I actually really liked about the 2020 Dracula BBC Netflix series, how they had an entire episode that took place on the Demeter. And obviously, I mean, you have to have thought that this was partially, the idea for this was partially inspired by that series because you saw how many liberties you can take with this portion of the story and expanding it without really affecting what happened before, what happens after. Like this is a portion of the story that you can really have your, your way with creativity creatively and move on into the next phases of the Dracula story. If you were to theoretically continue it in this one, they did something completely different. Of course, it's not 
something that is going to lead into the rest of the story because the way this film leaves off does not leave the rest of the story the way it was told in the book. So it still kind of is its own thing. Um, but nonetheless, I did enjoy the film quite a lot, actually. I mean, it's hard for me to dislike a film, including Dracula. Um, this film does have a lot of things in it that I did not like as well. But the goods outweigh the bads in The Last Voyage of the Demeter. But anyways, let's refer to the good old letterbox description and learn what this film is really about. It's a very short description. I think I actually described it a little bit better and more in depth than the description does. But the legend of Dracula is born. The crew of the merchant ship Demeter attempts to survive the ocean voyage from Carpathia to London as they are stalked each night by a merciless presence on board the ship. So that is the general consensus of what I gave you guys so far. Very mixed letterbox reviews from the people who have seen it that I am aware of. Um, some of my friends have given it one and a half stars. I think that's the lowest. And the highest one has given it four. So very high... Um, range of reviews here. I actually like the film quite a bit. As I mentioned, I gave it a four. So I'm on the higher end of the spectrum, the upper epsilon of ratings that I will give. Not a, not a ton of my friends have seen it. I can't believe Miles doesn't have it rated at all. But just in general, I love the cast. Um, Corey Hawkins is the lead in this film, and he was great in Straight Outta Compton as well. So I've enjoyed him as an actor. Um, a lot of the other cast does really well, too. There's not really a ton of standouts. Um, David Dismelchin is in it as well, but I don't remember him too, too much having a standout, standout performance. I mean, he was great in everything. Um one thing that I don't like about this film, I mentioned that I don't like a few aspects of the film. The effects, the CG effects are atrocious. Um, that might have given it a little bit less of a rating than I would have given it. And I might have given it four and a half. I might have went, went absolutely fucking bonkers with this. But CG effects, not good. Overall, like the story, like the vibe, like the aesthetic. Um, I love Period pieces like this. I obviously love Dracula stories. I love films that take place on a ship. I love ships. Um, just in general, just checks a lot of the boxes for me of what I'm going to like. When it comes to rewatchability, will I be rewatching The Last Voyage of the Demeter or will I be rewatching episode two of the Dracula BBC series that takes place on the Demeter? Which one of them told this story better? I like both. I think both of them are incredibly different. Obviously, one of them has a Dracula who is a monster, a Dracula who harkens back to pure predator, pure animal, no redeemable qualities. And the other is a very likable, charismatic character, quick-witted, funny. Like, the characters are just so different that I do enjoy both interpretations of the voyage of the Demeter, whether it be in the film or in episode two of the BBC series. It is a film that I want to rewatch. I'll probably rewatch it at some point, but regardless the following day, I went to the cinemas yet again, this time with a group to see talk to me. Um, this film, of course, by Michael and Danny Filippo. I believe that's how you say the last name. Um, very creative, people in general um and they were finally able to make a full-length feature film in theaters you call they'll answer when a group of friends discover how to conjure spirits with an embalmed hand they become hooked on the new thrill until one of them goes too far and unleashes terrifying supernatural forces i gave the film three and a half stars and with that three and a half stars being said i was kind of underwhelmed by the film i do like the film a lot i do think that it has a lot of cool things in it a lot of interesting things in it but it just didn't hit the mark in a lot of the ways that i think these sort of you know films that people regard as like a masterpiece film um it didn't hit all the ways in which i needed to like a lot of people on my letterbox give this film straight up five stars, if not five stars, four and a half. Um, for me, it was not quite at that level. It was not quite at that level. I do love the gore in it. I love the effects in it. I love the storyline. I love the drama. I love the character. I love the character of the film, but as well as the characters within the film. Um, I love how they sort of 
are doing this as just something fun to do, but then it turns into like a weird like addiction cult type thing. It can be an allegory for drugs. It can be an allegory for um, all kinds of different things. I just really... If this is another film I'd love to rewatch someday. I do want to give it a few years before I rewatch it, but this is a film I definitely want to revisit at some point in the future. It's another one of those films that I may have overhyped myself just a hair too much for it because it's another one of those summer a 24 type ish movies where all the marketing is saying this is the scariest film that you will ever see. This is the scariest film, not only of the summer, but of all time, the scariest, creepiest, mediocre film you could ever see. I'm just kidding. I like the film a lot. But regardless, talk to me. It is one that I want to rewatch. It is one that I am willing and open to rewatching at some point. Again, three and a half stars. Incredibly, incredibly favorable score for me. For me, it's tough to get above a three. Like a two and a half to three, that's where I think like good films are. I know it's kind of like weird because it's less than two and a half as half of five stars. But to me, two and a half to three is a good quality would rewatch again i like it sort of film anything that's two stars and below i don't like if it's three and a half and above like that's highly highly regarded by me speaking of films i think are are bad i'm going to just brush over this ever so briefly on the 13th i watched twilight new moon which i believe is the worst out of the twilight saga at least the least entertaining out of the films to watch the twilight saga new moon the next the next chapter begins forks washington resident bella swan is reeling from the departure of her vampire love edward cullen and finds comfort in her friendship with jacob black a werewolf but before she knows it she's thrust into a centuries-old conflict and her desire to be with edward at any cost leads her to take greater and greater risks. This film, I although I do like it because I do like Twilight as a series, is the weakest out of the out of the franchise, like by far. It's just so boring. It's just Edward talking through dreams telepathically. There's the hard scene at the end where he's in Italy at the Volturi place. Like the ending part is hard. Um, but most of the film I just find kind of boring. Like most of the film, like it's just kind of you got to power through it to get through to Eclipse, which is my favorite in the franchise. Um, And we'll talk about Eclipse in just a little bit. But before we get to Eclipse, on the next day, my wife and I watched The Pharaoh's Curse. A little bit of background about what The Pharaoh's Curse is and why we watched it. Pharaoh's Curse from 1957, directed by Lee Shalom, is a 66-minute horror film that I have given two stars. Now, why on earth have I heard of this film? Why on earth did my wife and I watch this film? Out of all the things my wife and I could have watched, there was a big meme on TikTok that my wife and I thought was the most hysterical thing of all time about the Pharaoh's curse. You can look it up if you would like, but it's basically about unfortunate instances, sand, Lots of sand and the desert theme from Super Mario 64. Put all those together. You have a meme that will last in my wife and I's hearts forever. The Pharaohs curse the film, however. Not so great. Strangest of all horror stories. Archaeologists in Egypt find one of their crew has been turned into a blood-sucking mummy after they've unleashed a 3,000-year curse. Sounds very generic. Very low-budget film. Doesn't have a lot of things coming together. Again, two stars did not enjoy it. I love it for the memes. Even though this film isn't even directly correlated to the memes, it was just sort of a funny thing my wife and I did together. I had a great time watching it with my wife. That was, that was a very interesting evening. Um... I was actually terrified of mummies. I'm pretty sure I've told this story on many podcasts before, but mummies were my most terrified monster to me as a child. I thought those were the most terrifying out of all the monsters, not vampires, not werewolves. The mummy for me is where true 
terror struck. But speaking of vampires, we watched a bona fide four and a half star film the next day, guys. One of my favorite interpretations of Dracula, one of my favorite films by Francis Ford Coppola. We're talking Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992, starring the illustrious Keanu Reeves and Gary Oldman and Anthony Hopkins and the great Winona Ryder. Very, very good film. (laughs) That's all I have to say. Very, very good film. I've talked about Bram Stoker's Dracula Um, A lot on the channel before I do recommend you guys go watch my entire review video essay research paper whatever you want to call it about the behind the scenes of Bram Stoker's Dracula. I liked it quite a bit. Um, But for the purposes of this podcast love never dies in 19th century England Count Dracula travels to London and meets Mina Harker a young woman who appears as the reincarnation of his first love. And the reason I love this film so much is it does take so many elements from past Dracula films and puts them all into one. It's a good potluck Dracula experience. You've got elements of the Jack Palance film. You have elements of the Bela Lugosi film. You got a little bit of John Carradine in there. You've got a little bit of the um, 70s books relating to Dracula, how it was based off of Vlad the Impaler, even though that's not completely accurate. Um, There's just so much brought into this film. It's a cornucopia of Dracula, and I love it oh so much. His beehive hair is ridiculous. We will get that out of the way. The beehive hairdo, quite askew, very askew. The Pope's Exorcist. Do I even need to talk about this one? Why is Russell Crowe a new exorcist icon? He was in The Pope's Exorcist last year. This year, he's in a film just called... The Exorcism, I believe it's called, where he's an actor playing a priest who is an exorcist in a film. Why is Russell Crowe just becoming your go-to exorcism gentleman? It is quite odd, very askew, quite strange. Directed by Julius Avery, inspired by actual fi- uh, the actual files of Father Gabriel Amorth, chief exorcist of the Vatican. Father Gabriel Amorth, chief exorcist of the Vatican, investigates a young boy's terrifying possession and ends up uncovering centuries-old conspiracies the Vatican has been desperately trying to keep hidden. I don't really know what to say about this film. I gave it three stars. I enjoyed it. But I can't remember a damn thing about this film. I can't remember a damn thing about The Pope's Exorcist. Can't remember a damn thing about it. So I may actually need to drop my rating for this film because watching it, enjoying it once, it did not leave any sort of impact on me, which is why I think we just need to kind of glance over it. I think we just need to skip over it, guys. I don't remember a damn thing about it. I remember a little bit about it, but nothing worth talking about. We're coming close to the end of this episode, guys. We're probably going to make it all the way through August, and then September through the end of the year is going to have to be another episode. But we're going to power through August. And guess what? We've got three Twilight films in a row, guys. There's still a film after the Twilight films, so if you don't give a shit about Twilight, you're still going to have to stick around and listen to me talk about them to get to the final film of August. But right now we're talking Eclipse. We are talking the Twilight Saga Eclipse, which may be my favorite out of the franchise. The one where I feel they were trying to make a good movie. The one where I feel like they actually had some sort of complex layering to the characters. Some sort of complex storylines where, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. This isn't a full review of Eclipse. But like, we'll get into a little bit of what I like about the film. It all begins with a choice. Bella once again finds herself surrounded by danger as Seattle is ravaged by a string of mysterious killings and a malicious vampire continues her quest for revenge. In the midst of it all, she is forced to choose between her love for Edward and her friendship with Jacob. Knowing that her decision has the potential to ignite the ageless struggle between vampire and werewolf, 
With her graduation quickly approaching, Bella is confronted with the most important decision of her life. One thing that I don't like about this film is I really think they dragged out that Victoria story way too long. I wish they could have wrapped that up in New Moon and had this have a new main thing that they were going after. But I think we still could have got the same the same place where we ended. I feel like the Victoria thing was just so drawn out between three films. Um, I don't know. For me, that part doesn't hit. But I like everywhere they go and all the adventures they have going to get to this climatic thing with Victoria towards the end. But for me, I think that just that whole plot, that storyline isn't good. But the stuff encapsulated within it is quite good. Like, I love when they're camping on the mountainside and it's cold. So Edward obviously isn't going to be any warmth for Bella in the night. So she has to be real close to Jacob. Stuff like that. Like, that's sort of like the character interweaving bizarre love triangle scenarios in this film that I like. Again, I feel like they were trying to make this very complex. Um, I've never read the books, so I don't really know, like, what aspects from the books were taken, which ones were not. Um, but in general, this film probably has... I will say with the exception... So, like, my favorites are the odd ones. So, like... I love the first one. I love three. And then I love Breaking Dawn Part 2, which is the fifth. Breaking Dawn Part 1, which is what we'll talk about right now, not the hugest fan of this one in comparison to Part 2, even though I give them similar ratings. I think Part 2 just gets the hair edge. But Part 1, forever, is just the beginning. The newfound married bliss of Bella Swan and vampire Edward Cullen is cut short when a series of betrayals and misfortune threatens to destroy their world. This one, like, it has some good elements in it. The beginning's great, um, but I feel like it turns its wheels a little bit too much. Like, a lot of it, you're just kind of, like, trapped in the house waiting for stuff to go on. There is some good stuff in there that I like, too, but, like, for the most part, this one is not as good as part two the epic finale the twilight saga breaking dawn part two the epic finale that will live forever after the birth of renesme the cullens gather other vampire clans in order to protect the child from a false allegation that puts the family in front of the volturi obviously the fight scene is insanely ridiculous and hilarious I love the training montages with Bella, um, the most jacked vampire of all time. Um, I love all the different vampires coming to the house. I love being able to interact with a lot of these different characters, even though a ton of them don't get a, a lot of screen time. It's nice to see this world in this universe outside of Forks, outside of the Seattle area, outside of what we know. I like to see... And some of the vampires come in towards the very end. Like, there's the ones that are secluded on the island or whatever that also have another hybrid child. Um, but I love that this actually has, like, lore, and you can see some inner workings of how this civilization is going on on Earth. Um, I really like that quite a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a ton to say. This isn't a full Twilight podcast. I still would love to do a Twilight podcast at some point. So if my wife and her friend Casey are out there listening, we talked about doing a Twilight podcast several years ago. It never came to be because of, I think that's like when the world first shut down, like the COVID era. So we never ended up doing it. But someday you may get a full-length Twilight podcast at Buddy's House of Horror. But right now we're talking the last film I saw in August. The finale of August was Slother House, a film that Miles dragged us to the cinemas. I gave it a solid two. It is obviously trash. The film knows that it's trash. It is a B movie. Um, it is self-aware that it is trash. Don't rush. Die slow like a sloth, like a slow-ass sloth. Emily Young, a senior, wants to be elected as her sorority's president. She adopts a cute sloth, thinking it would become a new mascot to help her win, until a string of fatalities implicate the sloth as the main suspect in the murders. 
obviously the sloth made this the slother house, the slaughterhouse of a sloth. It needs to be seen to be believed. Obviously, you know, going into it, you're not getting a five star masterpiece. So although I gave it two stars, there are some entertaining elements within this film, but I cannot justify giving it a halfway decent rating. Um, it was enjoyable to watch with friends in a theater. If I was watching that alone at my house, um, you would need to be heavily intoxicated in order to enjoy it. But it's a good film if you and your friends are hanging out or able to talk through it, laugh, do whatever. It's a good one to pop on if you want something incredibly stupid, incredibly ridiculous. My wife and I actually watched a film a few days ago that would fit into that category. But of course, that is for an episode of another podcast. That one, Aqua Slash, we will get to eventually once we get to it. But that wraps up August and that wraps up this podcast of Everything that I saw in the year 2023, part three, I think this is. I think this is part three. So with that, we will get to the outro that I'm going to be doing right now within this thing. I'm just going to do a quick pause, and then hopefully I'll remember to put the music hit, and then we will continue to do our outro. And that is about it for this time, you guys. As I just said, if you guys haven't already, please make sure you're subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications wherever you are listening to this show. You need to make sure that you are dropping a like, dropping a follow, leaving a five-star rating. And that is about it. So we will see you guys back here again for another episode of Buddy's House of Horror podcast coming at you real soon. So take care and stay spooky. <laughs>